That's what we want. We want the dirt. We want, we want, we want, we want the, the stories that no one else will tell. I'm here today to so. name names. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, here We're back here with Three Comics Money. We took a little bit of break over the holidays. Um, our first guest uh, after the holidays is Steve Scrose. Uh, he's He's done comics. He's rolling out a new one, Post Americana. We'll talk about it. Talk about uh, Pete couldn't join us today uh, at the time that we're meeting, but uh, he, he's normally be here. He's still part of Three Comic, and of course Mike is here. And then Steve, thank you so much for joining us. Um, sure, no, no problem. So I guess you always got to start off with just sort of like how you jumped into it. If uh, I saw it was around Ecto Kid, uh, Clyde Barker, or was that before that? Uh, yeah, that was the. Uh, yeah, I think that was the first, yeah, definitely that was the first one. Um, yeah, I was like 18 years old. It was back during the nineties boom and they would practically hire anyone who could hold a pen. And yeah, the Clyde Barker thing was, uh, you know, I didn't really hear the first thing you want to draw, like, especially back then was like something superhero ish. Mm -hmm. I'm like, Oh, what's this? Bro? I don't even know. <laughs> what Not even quite horror, but, um, yeah, it was an amazing experience, and that's actually how I met the uh, Wachowskis, who I went on to work in films yeah. and stuff. So, a very fortunate first job. So, how you, you met them through Clyde Barker, like the Wachowskis? They were hired as you know back then before they they were hired as the writers on this comic. James Robinson was the initial writer for I think the first two issues, then he bailed for something else, and they were two up and coming writers. And, uh, yeah, they put them on that book and, um, yeah, it was weird. And it was kind of around the same time they were almost about to sell their first screenplay, you know, that, that year of Ecto Kid that we worked together there, they were just selling their first screenplay and, you know, getting their toes into the entertainment business and all that. And then you worked with them through the Matrix trilogy, right? Yeah, pretty much. They did their first movie Bound and, uh, <sighs> leave the solid world of, uh, the comic book industry served for the fly by night world of show business. So I said no to bound. And then they, it was really funny. I was drawing X-Man at Marvel and they, uh, Lana was trying to get me to work on matrix. And I was like, nah. And then she like knew I was dumb and making a terrible mistake. So she said, you can work on your comic at the same time. And so they brought me out to LA and I would do storyboards and I would do my comic at nighttime. Mostly, you know, yeah. Most I was going out and drinking and doing all kinds of crazy. <laughs> And then cramming it all in at the last second, but uh, <laughs> so that you was, that was a, a kind of a wild experience. So you, did you get to actually like flesh out some of those iconic Matrix scenes, like storyboard them out, or? Well, I, yeah, I did them all. I did all the me and a few, uh, you know, obviously Jeff Darrow did the uh, concept designs. Another an amazing uh, storyboard artist called uh, Tony Kunitaki worked on it. Another guy, Warren Manzer, uh, Colin Grant was the other storyboard artist, and yeah. Between all of us, we they had very specific ideas of what they wanted, and uh, um, yeah. So the boards are are look very much like the movies. They're pretty much spot on. So yeah, I got to draw bullet time. Sadly, oh, I was going to ask. I was like, "Were you you got to actually figure out how to draw it?" And <laughs> no, I was just kind of like this. Uh, you know, uh, I, I held the pencil. I was like eight. I was like maybe twenty, twenty one, doing that. Mm. And, um, yeah, they just kind of liked me, and I was, you know, um, followed direction well, I guess. And, <laughs> well, cinemagraphically, uh, that movie was very different and new for the time with the 360-degree um, yeah. stuff, too, along with the bullet time stuff. So that, that had to be tough to – because I know storyboarding is – it's got to show that motion. So that must have been challenging. All of that. You know, to, for me, it was, just a, it was just a bunch of drawings moving around, the, you know, basically that, that pose – and I was mystified about the technical side of all of it, really, and still am. Uh, but yeah, I got to go to the set and see that setup, which was pretty cool, which was like this giant green space with like this kind of like w undulating kind of wave of camera, a camera setup that goes in a circle that kind of, you know, so they would, uh, you know, created that effect. That's cool. That, you know, wow. be, be there for it and stand awkwardly in the corner, you know. That's the weird <laughs> It's like, the, you know, you kind of are the scout. You go out first. And a lot of the times, you know, when I, the entire time I worked on the Matrix films, I was never, you know, it was never a greenlit movie. And every time I finished a couple months on it or a few weeks, 
it always looked like it wasn't going to happen, you know. And uh, when I finished it the last time, it looked like it had gone down in flames, and then it just kept get uh, resurrecting. And I think, uh, yeah, when I had finished it, my work on it, I think Kenny was. Uh, I don't know if he was even in the mix yet. And then they it was kind of dead, and then he came in and you know brought it back to life. Wow, I don't think I realized that it was it lived in that pre-production phase for so long. Where well, or... years, I mean, it was long for me because it was my little life back then, you know. And uh, yeah, but um, yeah, it's cool now. I can look back and really appreciate it. But uh, yeah, back then I was just so such a fish out of water. Um, but yeah, there were some some fun adventures in there for sure. Did you find did you find that that opened up a lot of different doors for you afterwards? Because it's that's an interesting thing to start with. What ended up being such a big movie? Well, that's why I sort of that I did comics for a while because that was my first uh, love. But I did wind up at, when they started up the sequels. That kind of put me on the path for movies for geez the better part of a decade. And you know those were great adventures. But yeah, over the last I don't know, five years or so, I've been really trying to do comics as much as possible. I did work on the new Matrix film. But that was the only one uh, since Stand on Guard, I think, um, which was the kind of the comic I returned to the industry with uh, yeah. a while ago. And um, yeah, so yeah, so hopefully I can just keep keep the uh, comic train rolling. Okay, okay that makes amazing jobs. Working on movies are so fun, and you get to travel around the world. But if you're a little, no, I'm still that. The dream was always to do comics, and you know. It's evolved now to kind of do your own comics. When I was a kid, it was like, once you draw the X-Men, that's it. You don't yeah. you stop moving and just lie down and your time on this earth has concluded. But Well, then when you came back in, too, you worked on Wolverine, too, for a while, right? Well, that was my last gig before I took off to do the Matrix sequels. Got it. Um, literally, like, finished that last page of Wolverine, and I was on the plane to L.A. to start the sequels. Uh, okay. And I didn't. And then we did Doc Frankenstein, which just took like God. That took like years to finish. But um, so that came out too. But yeah, that's that pretty much spans that whole. That was the comic I was working on in between movies. So, so then you you rolled back in with We Stand on Guard, which is with Brian K. Vaughn. Yep. That that's a great. That's a, one of those books that I I loved reading, and I don't understand why it didn't be more than what it was like. I, it's oh, just such a fun read. One of the best sales I've ever had, but uh, you know, it's six issues. Um, I guess you know it's a it's just a novel, and it doesn't carry on. I mean, uh, I don't know. Maybe it takes longer for people to fall in love with the characters or whatever. But uh, yeah, kind of. If you remember the ending of that book, it's uh, you know, there's not yeah. he left. <laughs> yeah, I guess it is one of those when you go, okay, I can't continue on like. When I think of Brian K. Bond's other ones, like Saga, which was at its peak, right, right when I got to write that. Uh, well, he has his cake and eats it, too. He does Saga, which is a massive, ongoing epic that we all love. And then, you know, he's got lots of really cool uh, minis that he's done with Mar uh, Marcos Martin, um, mm -hmm. all the, the the downloadable stuff that they got, like, you know, Private Eye. And of, of, of course, I'm forgetting his other one, other ones right now. But Oh, yeah, his own, he has his own little... Uh, digital co web comic company or whatever where like Donny Case just dropped something and yeah uh what was it panel syndicate yeah uh, yeah, yeah books and uh, I think uh Ed Brubaker and um Sean Phillips just put up some badass one that you know I still haven't read I'm behind on all, all my reading but I want to get on and get on those hopefully hopefully uh saga comes back to us at some point that'd be nice it's been, long, long, been a long break yeah They've got to come and, uh, you know, rescue the industry. And uh... <laughs> it's just so good. I mean, and it's so it's so like, viscerally good too, which we we needed. I think that's why people latched onto that and monstrous sort of together at the same time. They keep coming. Oh, that's um, it's consistent. You know, that's yep. such, a, such a high quality is so uh, challenging and. Um, yeah, I mean, the people doing comics, what I love about comics, I mean, they're doing comics because they could get jobs at some game company or whatever. Uh, although, it's not really successful, so those those guys couldn't pay them. But uh, but you know what I mean? The people doing comics are there because they can't not do comics, I think. Um, it's just, you know, awesome to create these books and 
tell these stories. Talk about talk about your process a little bit. What, what's that? What's that feel like to to an outsider? Like, how can you describe your your? I don't know. You can sort of hit that from anywhere you want to hit it. Like either the actual it's notes work are, itself or what. Starts out with like notes like this in a book, right? Mm -hmm. this, these are kind of like little mini shot descriptions that may or may not become panels, and that's kind of how it starts. And I'll you know kind of draw out how much I need for the sequence or scene, and then I'll kind of like combine or pull apart or like start adding those little panels to the pages to see what flows the best, you know, mm -hmm. there's just a ton of revisions and, you know, eventually, and I re revised pretty much up until the day I'm drawing, you know, this is kind of like, sometimes there'll be layers and layers of post-its on top of, you know, stuff I've already written, you know, right. And, uh, and then I work digitally. So I'll come down and I'll like, here's a, Let's see if this works. Whoops. Still there? Yep. Yes. So here we go. Oh, wow. Oh, what cool. On today? So uh, what did what you have post Americana? Is that? Uh, this is the cover for uh, the last one. Well, oh, for six. The, Ooh. Nice. Which I always, the covers are always going to last, you know? Yeah. But um, yeah, I should get a better picture of it. <laughs> the idea is later in the story, you don't really. One of the surprises you get to meet the um, in post Americana, you get to meet the lost IP of Wonder Studios. <laughs> and so, what basically, that is is like there's this, you know, in my futuristic world, there's like this, um, the, the, at the peak of their entertainment, uh, there was this, um, there was Wonder Studios who created all these comic book characters and you know, maybe familiar to, I don't know, some real life version of that. I can't think of a, you know, what it would be like, but, uh, but, you know, basically, so there, there are all these like super high end droids that have been left behind. They're all based on the IP of this old entertainment company. And they're kind of like the misfit toys, you know. Oh, but one of the things you learn if you've seen that like, there's a character called Night Terror hmm. in the comic, and you get to find out that he's actually not a real superhero. He's part of. He's just a, a, uh, you know, a security robot that's been skinned in okay. old characters' um, likeness, and he's got kind of some limited artificial. Oh, and that's his theme song. That you got. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> one second. Uh, so yeah, but so that's the last issue. I guess issue two comes out. Came out this week, next week. I think it comes out next week. Uh, well, like the twelfth, maybe the third Wednesday. Okay, I was just I was trying to think. I was like, okay, I just finished issue one, and like it was it wasn't what I expected, but I liked it. It was just one that's like, oh, what's what's that? It's supposed to be apocalyptic. And like I, I love the switch from the your main your main protagonist when she switches from I think she's one thing and then she just pulls out the gun and destroys everyone. You're like, oh hell yeah, I, I can get behind her. <laughs> yeah, well, you know what? It's actually a redemption story that's going to uh, end in a brighter place, but it starts starts kind of dark. I mean, it's supposed everyone likes to say dystopian, but it's yeah apocalyptic. I mean, dystopian is kind of I don't know what we live in now. Post yeah is like everything's over mm -hmm. i mean right. it's mass death there's no services anywhere where it's um you know it's it's the wildest of the wild wests you know yeah one well, has a i like how and this and this is your style like with the more i dug into you and realized like with your covers and everything you do have a unique style that like once you start identifying scrolls covers i'm like oh like when you start doing marvel variants and Everything is very evident in this last book. Like, we stand on guard. I know you had to stop, but it felt like you came back from the movies and you said, I'm taking what I like doing and I'm making it into this style and this look that is a scrolls. Like, I can't think of, I can see influence of other artists, but I can't say, man, you, you're, I throw you into this category. I don't know if that's a compliment to you or an insult or. Dare, <laughs> <laughs> it's both. Yes. <laughs> and I'm very grateful for the comment. No, uh, well, thanks. I, I appreciate that. You know, you know, my influences are on my sleeve and, uh, I just try my hardest. I always like what, uh, 
my the advice I give that I pretty much just take off Neil Gaiman is everyone, what do you have that no one else has? And like, it's yourself. And uh, hopefully, um, you know, it could, whatever I'm doing can be a little different, uh, you know, because, you know, I can bring a little a little bit of my personality to it. And hopefully that doesn't make it completely unlikable. You know? No, and you just mentioned probably my favorite writer in comics ever. So who's that? Gaiman. Oh, Gaiman, right. <laughs> yeah, he's good with the advice. He likes, uh, I always like that, uh, that piece. Um, it kind of, whenever I get my, you know, uh, you know, creatively um, uninspired, I like to think about him and some of the other, other people, you know, help, self-help things. Yeah, I, Chris, you're I searching for something. I see it. <laughs> I was sorry, I was, I was thinking of those, when I was thinking of the covers that you've just done for Marvel, that just stick in my mind. I'm like, okay, I know there's an Immortal Hulk one. You did two or three of those. Like like four covers last year. Might have been five. I did like, or over the last year and a half or something, I did like a Doctor Strange one. I did a Hulk. Um, Thor. I did one of Thor, which was really cool. I'd never drawn him before. Busting through Galactus' head. Yeah, I like getting those things every once in a while. Uh, when they think of me, it's, uh, I still, you know, I still like all that stuff. Um... But yeah, like I said, I'm behind on my my reading. I'm not sure what's going on there. <laughs> well, that would be those would be major spoilers for Thor, anyway. <clears throat> Immortal Hulk hasn't been quite what I've wanted it to be lately, but I'm sticking with it for the moment. <laughs> I started really good, but uh, yeah, I guess this just keeps going on. I don't know. Um... I'd heard it was going to end so many times, like 20, issue 24, then it was going to be issue 30, and now here we are, and I think close to issue 40 now. So it seems like. Uh, Seems like they took the popularity and ran with it a little bit. Nothing wrong with that. That's that's you know. no. I like the Very. characters interesting after so long. It's like amazing. Yeah, it's it is especially in this day and age. I feel like a lot of a lot of people are going towards the mini, which is a great idea because um, then you get to gauge, you know, how how people feel about the story. Do they want more? If they do, then you do another mini. If they don't, then you stop. Right, but you at least came to an end at some point. People don't get frustrated that we're fans, but to keep a, a essentially a new version of a character going for forty plus issues is impressive these days. I feel like, yeah, for sure, and I mean necessary for those characters because you can't really—I don't know, maybe you, you can—but they don't really have endings. They just kind of like evolve into the new version with the new team. Right, and that is the one thing I do like about doing six issues or doing something that has a conclusion. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a, so it's kind of novel uh, compared to the big two, you know, having a, a nice ending that you can build towards. And uh, I don't know, I feel like uh, I'll feel satisfied if I pay my twenty dollars or whatever for a, a trade paperback. Right, exactly. And do you do you plan on sticking with with the model that you're you're in right now, sort of writer, cover artist, interiors, do the whole thing kind of yourself with you know, obviously a little well, help here and there. Or uh, who's the, the greatest colorist in the in the universe? And uh, Stephen Finch of Phonographics, uh, the greatest you know uh, letterer and uh, graphics person. And uh, yeah, as long as we can keep it going, definitely, I would love to just keep. You know, I'd like to do sequels to these things too. I'd love to return to Maestros. I've got other ideas for this. I have a basically during my time on film, I have my a little book that I would just fill up with ideas, and um, hopefully, fingers crossed, I get to get to them. And I would love to put them all on on the page. You know, if I could. And uh, yeah, that's the way I want to spend my time anyway. Yeah, absolutely. I and I, I, I prefer. I've moved. I've moved much more toward that in my reading, and uh, and he'll just point things out. I just read this. This is great. You got to grab that. I'm like, I've never even heard of that. Where, where have you even seen that thing? So and I'll grab it. Of course, it'll become my favorite for months. And so um, I'm moving away from kind of the big superhero y thing and and more yeah. toward the the indie thing that you're doing. It's it's just a. I don't know. It suits my tastes. I'm not more. A, I'm not just harder, I think, uh, you know, I don't know what the solution is over there. Um, yeah, I like my superheroes too, but I had, you know, I kind of pop in and pop out. They got to, you know, it's, you got to grab me. Yep. I'm a yeah. waiting. Um, well, like when I look at your early stuff while you're before Matrix and all that, like you'd pop in and do, ca you did Cable for a long run. You did uh, Ecto Kid, then you did Spider Man for four or five issues. Like it had to be compared to what you're doing now. Where you were just the assigned artist, and 
did you did you have much say so it was like hey i'm doing spider-man and spider-man's doing this thing and i just gotta do spider-man well in those days yeah i mean that was the goal i mean all i ever wanted to do was be a marvel artist and i think i was there for like 10 years mm -hmm. uh, i did a lot of comics there um but yeah i mean back i remember i definitely campaigned to get um you know i flew to new york after ecto kid ended and hung out in the x office and um because I wanted an X-Men book. Those are the books I read I liked, and I knew they were popular. And, you know, when that kind of ended, uh, I tried to get Spider-Man and uh, finally got a hold of that. And, yeah. And Spider-Man ended. No. <laughs> well, my time on <laughs> Matrix came. Like Marvel was super accommodating. I will, I will give them that. I mean, uh, they always treated me uh, really well. Bob Harris was very nice and let me keep the book and come back. They're like, they were also like, Oh yeah, this is kind of cool. You get to work on a movie. And, uh, so ultimately, yeah, I did kind of leave for the movies, but, um, <clears throat> there was always a bit of Marvel DNA in me, you know? Yeah, sure. I think probably for, for a lot of, for a lot of folks, I mean, especially growing up, you would probably have read that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> kind of hard to, kind of hard to remove it from your bloodstream once it's in there. Oh, it's in there. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. We're still what up uh, if you if you were to i mean maybe you won't ever go back to that but if you were to work on a big project again like an x book or something what would be your what would be your god i, I really want to work on this my whole life i've wanted to work on this character or this team or what would it be um i don't know i could see a few of them i mean i like wolverine it's just hard because you're like there have been so many great tales about them told about them you're like what could i bring to it you know yeah i had to go back maybe i would do commandi or something or, uh, <laughs> I <could> have, <laughs> someone, well, someone's been uh like if I, did, I have an idea for a superman story and <laughs> i like it and who knows maybe one day they'll you know i could do that everyone wants to do batman it's just uh you know i would probably you know you know it, it, it sort of depends i mean it's hard to be creating your own thing and doing your own thing so but if that were, if I had to, you know, jump on something, yeah, I would do one of the iconic characters for sure. And um, would you do like, I'm thinking of like Kari Andrews did Spider-Man Reign. So it was his entire piece. It's an offshoot of, it is Spider-Man, but it's not. Uh, there's a guy right now, oh shoot, what's the book now? There's a book coming out right now where it's, they're the writer, the artist, they're everything on the book, but it's a Marvel superhero. So doing sort of that where you get full reign of the decisions and it's going to be not the main continuity but focus on what's one thing i would if i, I don't know if i had any sway over that i would just say focus on the specific you know the entertainment value of whatever the thing is you're selling whatever comic that is uh the crossover thing i don't know it's tough it's hard to go from one to the other and have them keep having stakes you know um so yeah i would almost prefer that as a as a somebody who buys comics i would probably put my money down for an r2 uh, a tour vision like um daniel warren johnson's wonder woman you know like mm -hmm. i'm gonna do that before i buy regular wonder woman because you know i kind of have already seen regular work yeah I mean, that's a dead earth one yeah the, the black label yeah it was pretty cool i like that one i didn't <clears> see <throat> batman was nude <laughs> the bat wang that away. Uh, <laughs> so I, mean, I think it's pretty cool when a, when a when a creator takes over sort of a character, whether it's a well established one or it's not. I'm thinking, you'll Chris will make fun of me for giving this example, but I think of Frank Thorne taking over Red Sonia and doing everything, covers, letters, write, you know, even helped with the writing. Um, obviously, the interiors, he even colored it. So just you know when you really latch onto a character like that and you make it yours in some way, it's pretty cool, which is what you get to do with the books you're doing, which is, which is awesome. So, I mean, it's your, it's your baby the whole way, which is the passions in there. Image comics is uh yeah, I mean, I don't think there's a deal like it. And um, yeah, that's, I can sing its praises all day. So do you, I mean, I know having, how, because you have a name and you've been in the industry a while, do an image like we've talked to a few guys who've done image books and they've done Im Boom and they've done uh, Marvel and DC. Like image, you're in complete control. You showed up at Image and say, "I got an idea," and I got four books already made in this idea, and we're ready to go. And they just say, "Here," and they hand over and say, "We'll we'll publish it for you." I mean, 
like, do you have to do all the selling or do they sell any of it for you? Well, they, yeah, they work as a, you know, I came in, Brian kind of got me in good. We had the success of, uh, we stand on guard and then, uh, yeah, they let me, um, you know, you have to, I guess, sell an amount and so far so good. And, um, but you know, it's, um, yeah, they, you absolutely no complete, um, creative control. You can't, you can't get that really anywhere else. And, um, yeah, no one bothered you or, you know, there's, no, there's no sort of, you know, don't put this in there. You, as you know, if you've read the first issue, it's kind of violent. It's pretty gory. Yeah. Um, yeah, they, no, no, no one has an issue with, with that. I mean, well, speaking of the, be in my last comic, no one cared. I mean, it's like, I'm always surprised at comic fans who get a little bent out of shape if they're swearing in a comic book or something. Cause it's like, <laughs> don't you have HBO? I mean, <laughs> into the movies i mean there's r-rated movies i mean i guess there are people who just don't ever cross the yeah rated boundary but. well and i can understand it from a standpoint of my my superheroes if spider-man crosses a line that i wouldn't see him crossing that might especially if i'm going i'm going to hand this to my daughter or my son to read at 10 but it's it, then you're right but if I click on, not even clicking on HBO anymore, if I click on the latest Fox. sitcom, Fox sitcom, yeah, um, there's going to be that language. There's going If I click on cartoons, there's nothing stopping a kid from watching Rick and Morty and the parents not even paying attention to what's going on. Right. Or, right. Yeah. Yeah, sure. But I think yeah. that allows for a wider range of, of your creativity, too. I mean, some of the things that would have been limited – you know, based on the comics code or whatever it was during during those years before it went kerplunk, you know, it's uh, it allows you to really tell your story the way you want to tell it. And that I mean, and if people don't like it, they don't have to read it. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. That's, that's sort of a cynical way of looking at it. But, you know, put it down. Go pick up something else. Chef, chef choice for everybody, you know, and, you know, anybody can, uh, you know, talk trash about whatever it is they're, they're buying or consuming, you know. Um, Oh, and they will these days, especially if they don't have to do it face to face. Trust me, I know. <laughs> have, I've seen it. Yeah, have yeah, you yeah. started to develop like? Do you have rabid fan bases for uh, Maestros or like? Of course, Post American just came out, so I don't know. Like, like the, you have a style and a look, so I could easily see a crossover effect happening if you ever wanted to go from the Maestros world to the Post Americana world and do a Danny Donny Cates little. We're gonna combine them all, but. Like, do you have that rabid fan base that some artists and writers have started to develop? Well, you might see my the lost IP from Wonder Studios pop up other places, but uh, you know, I there's there's no no plans for that. Uh, but um, yeah, I mean, they're kind of. I kind of feel like who George Martin kind of says about uh, you know science fiction and fantasy and uh, the different which you prefer and the way he put it is. Um, it's all the same. It's just the furniture is different, you know? I mean, yeah. either it's fantasy or a redemption story is a redemption story, you know, and it's just kind of like, you know, the genre is kind of just, you know, the, the, the flavors or tropes that you like kind of mixed up, hopefully in a, a fresh way. Uh, you know? Tony Morrison said a quote I love, she said something to the effect of everything there is to write has already been written. It's how you write it that matters. Yeah, sure, exactly. I'm, I'm with that too. Yeah, a lot of those great people have that. Like Stanley Kubrick says something similar, and yeah, I like, uh, yeah. So, where do you see that? Where do you see the industry going in the future? I mean, I think there's a lot of talk about. There's, a, the, you know, you, I'm sure you've heard it too. Oh, that it's going to crash again, and too many variants, and there's you know, this, that, and the other thing. But where do you, where do you feel it'll be? Say, I don't know, five years from now. Mm, hard to say. I'm very bad. Uh, not much of a. Scrosadamus is my predictions have always been, but I think the comic industry or as an art form on a whole, you look at comics are really scholastic now, you know, mm -hmm. I believe those sure. kids are going to grow up and be inspired and they're going to go make great comics. And so I think the future of comics will be good. I mean, the thing that we're doing with at the, the big two where you're with the variants and all that, I mean, I know uh, people say it's bad, but I guess people like that. I mean, there's a, a certain component of the industry or a large section where it's, it's all about the collecting, uh, you know, maybe even more than the stories. And uh, I don't know. I mean, if they're not spending their dollars, dollars on those things, why should I think that they're going to spend them on my story? You know, right. not, I don't really know. Uh, my hope is that there's enough quality out there and like there'll be enough. You've got Saga and uh, hopefully someone else or anyone can 
you know, just keep that interesting interest going. I mean, there, there's so many great uh, works out there. You just kind of have to hope they connect with people and uh, keep those stores going. And, and I have faith. I think we'll, you know, it's always up and down in this business, but uh, there's too much great work out there to have it, you know, not find a new place. And, I, th I think too, oh, sorry. Well, no, yeah. I've just seen with like image comics, especially the, the, the focus they put on, yes, the, the floppies, the single issues are important, but getting that good story into the trade paperback and then seeing the numbers on maybe not being equivalent, but you're selling six issues in one. And uh, like, like how did like we stand on guard and how did uh, Maestros do when it hit to the trade paperback? Cause I do know, like I'm one that will go pick up an independent book. I might get issue one, but then I'm going to grab the trade paperback and I'm going to read your story and I'm going to read it digitally. I, Cause, and then I'm amazed. And then I go get the other issues cause I love the story. But I won't do that sometimes initially just because it has to strike me. And, I, and and a lot of times you guys that write for independence and image, it, you write with six issues in mind. So sometimes issue one might not end in a place where I'm like, okay, crap, do I want to read issue two? But man, when I read the entire trade, it's amazing. Well, yeah, it's tricky. I do try to think about cliffhangers in the chapters. I mean, it is an action adventure story. So you can kind of, you know, there's danger throughout, you know, so... Uh, I do try to think of something, hopefully, that's a cliffhanger that will make you go, what? I got to get that issue. You know, I don't want to end on anybody like, you know, making their, you know, favorite. They're just walking. <laughs> <laughs> make, make any grilled cheese at the kitchen counter. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think there's also the model of the, the streaming networks are changing things, too, with optioning a lot of indie titles and being able to use a, a different kind of a budget to put these things on screen for people that might not read comics prior to having seen the show. You think of something like Umbrella Academy or um, uh, the, Bo the Boys, Old Guards, another great example, things like that, that people might not have even realized were comics. And then they might sort of retroactively go back and read them. Um, I know I did with a few of them. I had never read a single word of The Boys. Yeah, me neither. And then, uh, but yeah, but it's a gigantic commercial for your product and it yep. reaches millions of people. And maybe, you know, I don't know, 5% of those people are like really into it and go buy your books. That's a f massive number. Yep. So, yeah, I'm not really against that. You know, it's nice that uh, those books and those creators get to, you know, have their work exposed that way. Even if the show turns out as different and maybe not as good, you've got the original version out there that helps the creators go on and, you know, it's their living, and then they can go on and keep uh, making new stuff. And yeah, uh, it keeps money in the keeps money in the industry too, which is also good. Totally keeps the eye on the industry. So yeah, I don't know. I guess there's you always hear that. Well, you know those comics, they make them just so they can sell them as a movie or whatever. I guess people do that, but I don't know. Any good any good show I've seen is that's based on a comic. The comic usually has to be pretty good, or you know, people be really into it. Right. So hate it. I don't think we're crapping something out, you know. Uh, did you write post Americana? Did you have like, oh, I'm picturing this actress or this? Not that you would ever drink, but like, I can't imagine when you're writing someone of a, a person, you always have to have someone envisioned when you're doing. I would think. I like, do, uh, but it's not a real person. <laughs> the things I wanted to bring. To it was, She's a plastic doll in your bedroom. No, <laughs> <laughs> you just watched Weird Science again. <laughs> Listen, I don't want to bring Denise into this, guys. <laughs> I'll talk before the show. Come on. <laughs> Our love doll community was sacred. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> poor Sam. But really, it's Conan. Post of she's Conan. It's like I wanted someone who was like how they would describe him in the book. You know, this uh, when when Conan would appear, he was scary and and ominous, and he was sort of. Uh, you know, he was a Northman and, uh, you know, you got to watch out and uh, he's got a very scary reputation. And I love, and one of the things I tried to create with this kind of uh, American ruin is that it's kind of this sparsely populated, uh, destroyed place, like a mythological world. You know, all these people are living uh, in the ruin of, the, of, this, of this great uh, country and world that's, that's no longer around. And uh, that's what I loved about Conan, too, is you would walk in and there would constantly be, you know, some lost city or, or fallen city that they're they're dealing with and so that's kind of 
a few of the, the fantasy tropes that I kind of wanted to put into this because I feel like a sword and horse sorcery kind of story, you know, isn't so different than like roaming the wasteland in your, uh, you know, uh, for, uh, you know, your Hummer or whatever it is. I love Conan. You I mean you're hit, you're hitting on all of my cylinders. So, and, and I, 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 uh, I love stuff like that, obviously, but I've already That's brought up Red Sonia too. <laughs> Yeah, like Red Sonia, but uh, she's a little less um, cheesecakey. You know, we don't. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> the mic's done with you now. You 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 took away. You, you insulted Red Sonia. No, it's hard to be more cheesecakey than than Red Sonia. So I love Red Sonia. Don't don't get me wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, anything um, else? Anything different on the horizon besides this that we're unaware of that you can divulge? And then hopefully there'll be. Uh, you know, more more soon, but uh, I hope hopefully I just keep uh, want to keep making comics, and hopefully there'll be a series out a year by me. Uh, that's a, that's a nice. I like that. Uh, do you mean like a six issue? We're gonna six issues of promoting it while I'm writing the rest of them, and six I seven. Like that. Kind of just I want to stop one as soon as one ends. I'll start start another one if that's possible, and just keep Sorry, that. I'm uh, having trouble understanding yeah. right now. Please try a little later. <laughs> Is that, is that your, that, uh, my uh, my 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 sex doll was no. My was trying to talk to me. Uh, I call her Alex A. Um, oh, for your vodka. <laughs> Alex A. <laughs> but, um, uh, that, so so does that does that uh, five or six month assuming release times are are normal, <laughs> unlike last year. Um, does that five or six month gap give you enough time, do you think, to flesh out whatever the next thing is going to be? Do you feel pretty comfortable with that? Um, sure. I mean, they're, they're all kind of been in the cooker for a long time. And, you know, there's lots of notes and uh, you can kind of just, I can at this point just kind of sit down and start breaking it down and then drawing it, you know. So, but yeah, it takes a long time to draw the comics, you know, it takes like, uh, but as I'm drawing a page, I'm thinking about the next page and doing tweaking and revising on that, even though I've settled on what's going to happen on that page, there's always more decisions and, uh, you know, I'll add something late in the game that might change the story. You know, you kind of have your signposts along the way, but you got to give yourself a little permission in between reaching those points to, you know, be imaginative and make sure you're keeping your story interesting and all that. So does, does Dave uh, Stewart bring in like as you've worked with him now for two different three different series like does, does, do you guys have a feel like okay Don Dave's going to come in and he's going to say let's use this cream color that I love versus the dark color that you were implying here or, uh, I kind of tell Dave I learned very quickly that uh, just not to bother him <laughs> he's really amazing and I'm lucky that he's taking the time to do my comic and uh, he always brings something a dimension to it that was more than if I had like, you know, yoked him with a bunch of notes, you know? Mm. So I try, so I'm always surprised and, you know, straight up elated when I, his, he sends his pages in. Cause you're like, he always gets, he always gets it. And he always finds a little, like he, he doesn't kind of, he, he looks at everything in the drawing and completely reads and understands everything and just adds to the storytelling and the drama and um, humor if necessary. Mm -hmm. And that, even Finch too. He's like really understands composition and uh, where to put the balloons and uh, his sound effects. A lot of the time, you know, a lot of editors. I mean, he integrates them very well in the artwork. And so, so yeah, it's really because that, yeah, that can be distracting when it's done wrong. Yeah, he and brings out your your drawings like because you put in a lot of immense detail, but then the color comes in and like. I don't, <clears throat> it flattens it a little bit, but it makes it everything pop even better. Like, I love the way it ends up being. When you get a kind of a complicated, like, line style, it's great to have a colorist that can create the depth for you. Because I'm not, there's no blacks, right? I'm not using heavy blacks. Mm -hmm. So, really Dave is the one doing all that, doing all the, the separating and uh, creating the depth. Of the, you know? And, uh, you know, if you had a colorist that wasn't as good, I mean, it would look crappy, you know? Mm -hmm. So, uh, Steve, thank you so much. Do you have anything like I, we are? You got Post Americana issue two comes out next week. You're gonna, I'm assuming, every month you'll have another issue of that. Uh, yes, yeah. and my book Maestros is out there as well. Uh, check that out if you want. If you want, a um, little bit different than Maestros, but you know, um, yeah, 
Hopefully, of course, we stand on guard too. We stand but, uh, on. Their Doc Frankenstein came out last year as well. Uh, okay. And that, that's about all, all of my work. You got you got any Marvel covers lined up? That, but I, like Immortal Hulk's the last one I remember. But. I did Hulk, and then I, I did a Cable one, I think it was the last one that came out. Okay. You know, yeah. That's about it. And I'm looking forward it. to more of this story, to, to more of what's going on with Post Americana. That's yeah, it, the, it's cool. Thanks for that. We have a bad habit on this show of getting a guest on and then going voraciously around town to try to, <laughs> to, to, to because so. <laughs> we get so excited about what yeah. we've just talked about. So it's it's uh, it's cool. It sounds like it's perfect for me. So I hope I hope you like it. It's uh, they fight cannibals in the second one and. Uh... It's, yeah, and it's all the scary people from Mad Max Beyond the Thunderdome. Like I'm like, oh no, everyone's scary looking, and <laughs> it's, it's perfect. Well, they're way scarier than the Thunderdome people. The Thunderdome <laughs> had to work within a uh, PG-13 uh, parameter. True, that's but true. I, as long as one of the characters says Master Blaster, I'm happy. That's all I want. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? I have little uh, tip, tips of the hat to the road we're all over there. I have a yellow school bus that I throw in in a later issue that you see. Uh, I've got this big, this guy called Mr. Wonderful, who's kind of the leader of the cannibals, who's this totally jacked, crazy looking guy that uh, is totally, um, you know, tip of the hat to the great humongous from Road Warrior. And, uh, you know, he's like needlessly muscular. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm constantly throwing down little shout outs to my favorite post-apocalyptic work. So That's awesome. I'm, I'm excited for it. I'm literally... And, and and I have no problem admitting that I haven't read it yet, and I, and I I feel bad for having not read it prior to us meeting, but um, but I'm looking forward to hitting that up. It's, it's not, it really does sound perfect for me. So. I give books to my friends to read. I'm just like, why would I? They appreciate that I don't burden them with that. But I'm like, here's my <laughs> go rest 200 pages, come back with your review, and they're like, I don't even like comics, Steve. <laughs> and and to Chris's credit, he did try to get me to buy it last week, last Wednesday. He pulled it off the rack and handed it to me, and I put it back. <laughs> well, only because I had a stack of like fifteen other books in my hand. I'm like, dude, I have. There's a budget. Like I had to stop at some point. <laughs> you know, like ninety eight proof. You know what I mean? It's a strong. <laughs> strong. I mean, if it's like, uh, you know, it's not Looney Tunes or anything. Uh, you know, you can't go from Space Jam to write this post Americana. No. Okay. You, know, you, <laughs> you have to be in an, in an indie mode to switch in because it's it definitely is a lot. It's it's gory, but it's not gory. Like it's <clears throat> it's not like you can't for me. Like believe it or not, even though I draw gore all the time, like I'm very squeamish when it comes to anything kind of. So I have the tone of it is kind of on purpose. You can't. If I was doing real cannibalism, that was. You know, I want there to be a sense of danger, there's tension, but at the same time, it's uh, maybe a couple steps closer to the evil dead than it is to Cormac McCarthy's. Oh, per that's a perfect, okay. yeah, yeah, that's what it feels like is the, the tree coming out and the corn corn can m brains from the first issue. Like, there's fun, uh, you know, yeah, it's a little fun. <laughs> horrible I'm doing is fun. <laughs> All right, Steve. Thank you so much for joining us, uh, guys. CBSI, comicbookinvest.com. Uh, we'll have this up. It'll be up either Friday or Saturday. So thank you so much. And I'll send it to you. Oh, okay. You betcha. We really appreciate your time. Thanks very much. It's been great talking to you. Thanks for buying the comic. Or thank you for buying the comic. You. <laughs> <laughs>